Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast. I'm your host, James Laidler. In this first episode of Season 5, we'll be taking a close look at the poem The Lake Isle of Innisfree by William Butler Yeats. This is a rather beautiful poem to kick off the new season, so let's get into it by taking a listen to the poem itself, read to you by Adrian Dunbar, with music by Kayuka. I hope you enjoy this musical adaptation of a fantastic poem. Lake Isle of Inish Free by William Butler Yeats. I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows shall I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping like the veil of morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and the evening full of the linnet's wings. I will. Arise and go now, for always night and day. I hear lake water lapping low sounds by the shore, while I stand in the roadway, or on the pavement's grey. I hear it in the deep heart's core. Welcome back. So before discussing some of the key ideas and themes in the poem, perhaps a few words about the literary and historical context are probably in order. The Lake Isle of Innisfree originally emerged as a segment from the early version of Yeats's sole-published novella, John Sherman. In this story, the protagonist faces challenges in adapting from a tranquil existence in the picturesque Irish countryside to the harshness of London. Similar to the character of Sherman, the speaker in the poem yearns for the idyllic Western Ireland and a simpler way of life that is in tune with the natural world. Although Yeats was famously self-critical of his early works and often made revisions even after their initial publication, the Lake Isle of Innisfree stands out as an exception. Unlike his usual practice, Yeats made minimal changes to the poem, adding only a comma after it was published in the National Observer in 1890 two years after it was written. This demonstrates the meticulous attention and care that Yeats devoted to composing Innisfree, which underwent multiple drafts and adhered to intricate metrical patterns. In fact, Yeats referred to this poem as my first lyric with anything in its rhythm of my own music, and frequently performed it in his readings, underscoring its special significance to him. Throughout his life and writings, Yeats exhibited a fervent fascination with spiritual matters, encompassing religion, the occult, and paranormal phenomena. While his later works took on a more modernist tone, his early poems were influenced by romantic poets such as William Blake and Percy Bysshe Shelley. As a teenager, Yeats read Henry David Thoreau's Walden, a renowned book associated with transcendentalism, a philosophical and social movement that emphasised the inherent goodness of humankind and the natural world, as infused with divinity. 
Inspired by Thoreau, Yeats aspired to live in solitude and harmony with nature, citing Walden as a chief influence on the Lake Isle of Innisfree, as evidenced by the resonance between the nine bean rows in the poem's third line and the chapter title The Beanfield in Thoreau's work. The Lake Isle of Innisfree is a poem of immense popularity and wide-ranging impact. It is widely regarded as one of Yeats's most well-known poems, a notable distinction for a literary figure of the 20th century who is widely considered to be of paramount importance. So in this middle section of the podcast, I want to talk a little bit here about the themes of nature and spirituality in the poem. The poem's narrator dreams of creating a solitary and serene existence on Innisfree, an unpopulated island off the coast of Ireland. A portrayal of the island is idyllic and picturesque, while also underscoring its incompatibility with modern life. Through this depiction, the speaker suggests that returning to nature can offer unique spiritual rewards. The speaker employs mystical language to describe Innisfree, extolling the spiritual power of the natural world. The poem begins with the phrase, I will arise and go, which is a direct reference to the Bible. This exact phrase appears twice in the King James Bible, which Yeats, being brought up a Protestant, would have been very familiar with. Variations of this phrase also appear in other parts of the Bible, such as Let Us Arise and Go and We Will Arise and Go, found in Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament. As a result, it is unclear whether the speaker is alluding to a specific story or using biblical language more broadly. Nevertheless, this allusion does suggest that the speaker is embarking upon a spiritual journey. Of course, the well-known parable of the prodigal son features the exact phrase mentioned here, I will arise and go, and serves as an example of how the illusion might bring meaning to certain interpretations. This parable is shared by Jesus with his disciples in chapter 15 of the book of Luke. It tells the story of a man with two sons, one of whom squanders his inheritance by leading an extravagant lifestyle in a far-off land. When a severe famine strikes and he runs out of money, the younger son finds himself destitute and working as a swineherd. He decides to return home and says, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants. In the parable, the father forgives and embraces the son upon his return, celebrating his homecoming. When the older son objects, the father explains that they should rejoice because the lost son has returned. By referencing this story, the illusion suggests that renouncing material possessions and returning to nature is akin to the prodigal son's repentance and reunion with God. The replacement of father with Innis Free elevates nature as a divine healing and forgiving force. The illusion recurs at the end of the poem, showcasing the speaker's resolve to seek spiritual fulfillment by living a simple life on Innis Free. The poem also contains subtle references to religious traditions, such as the metaphor of the veils of mourning, which compares early morning weather to religious head coverings. Phrases like purple glow and midnight's all a glimmer create a dreamy and supernatural atmosphere. The speaker feels a deep personal connection to Innisfree, which seems to call out to them day and night, resonating in their deep heart's core. The speaker sees nature as a divine force that can bring inner peace. The poem also emphasises that communion with nature is the only path to attain spiritual rewards, suggesting that modern society hinders the pursuit of truth and peace. The speaker expresses a persistent desire to leave the city, as illustrated by the penultimate line where the sound of splashing water captivates the speaker while they stand on the bleak and austere pavements of the city. The use of the word grey in this line draws attention to the drabness of city life as a barrier to spiritual fulfilment. Overall, the speaker presents nature as a profound spiritual force that holds essential truths and wisdom, but accessing it requires a complete 
renunciation of modern society. So it's time to wrap up our first episode for Season 5 and say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this week's poem. Next week we'll be featuring the poem Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. To support our work, please subscribe to the podcast or to our YouTube channel. You can also visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. A video clip for this week's poem is now live on YouTube. We'll finish by listening one more time to the poem. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time. and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows shall I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow dropping like the veil of morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and the evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping low sounds by the shore while I stand in the roadway or on the pavement's grey. I hear it in the deep heart's core. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.